Hello everyone and uh, thanks for uh, being uh, here today with us for this uh, webinar ar around uh, the road to SD1. First, uh, let me introduce our speakers of today. So the first one is uh, Dries Storm. Dries is a product manager at uh, Orange Belgium and is in charge of fixed products, so including SD1, of course. And then we have uh, Stefan Van Aken. Stefan is uh, manager pre-sales and so is the guy uh, who transform wishes into reality, let's say. And finally, myself, Aude Gouverneur, I'm a customer value proposition. And so my role is to be, let's say, your voice and your eyes uh, in the market. So uh, today, uh, we will uh, zoom in a specific part of your data journey. So at Orange, we aim to support the companies in their full uh, digital transformations through the full data journey. But today's scope will be to zoom uh, in the transportation part and reach connectivity. And therefore, uh, Dries will begin with an introduction just, just to fix the basics uh, and make sure everyone uh, knows uh, what, what SD1 uh, is. And then Stefan and myself will continue with uh, the expectations you can have about this technology and uh, we'll close this uh, webinar with the getting ready uh, phase. Uh, we will, of course, keep a few minutes for your uh, questions, but Dries, can you begin setting the scene, please? Thank you for uh, this introduction, Oat. Um, so just to understand why um, as the one is such a hot topic today, um, let's look at a bit of history. So historically, um, private MPLS was used as a backbone core for networks, and it allowed companies to connect their headquarters with um, their branch offices and their data centers, and it gave a guaranteed performance, it gave guaranteed bandwidth, and it also allowed quality of service. And at a certain point, the internet happened. And what is interesting about the internet is that it's always best effort. So best effort, this means that um, tr traffic can travel up to a couple of milliseconds to reach the destination, but it can also um, take up to a couple of hundreds of milliseconds to reach the destination. And in some cases, it can even be that it doesn't even reach its destination at all, because it's best effort. And this is really important to take into account um, in the further continuation of um, this presentation, as it will add an extra complexity layer. Then, in more recent history, um, there was the emergence of cloud services with um, cloud providers like Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure. And Cloud comes with a lot of benefits. Um, you have faster deployment times because you have a server up and running in a couple of clicks, but it also reduces the cost because you don't need to invest in um, um, equipment like servers and so on. But typically, those cloud services are reached by the internet. And as said, the internet is best effort. I said, Typically, because there are also other um, solutions in which you have a direct connect from your private MPLS to um, the cloud services, giving mm -hmm. you guaranteed bandwidth again and quality of service. What complexifies um, the one even more is um, the emergence of all, always um, more demanding applications that have strict requirements on quality of service. So let's look, for example, at voice or um, video services. They have strict requirements what concerns latency or jitter. And then you also have IoT, uh, Internet of Things, in which we try to connect millions of objects. This also um, helps in making everything a bit more complex. And there is also the ever-emerging need of mobility. Um, your digital workers want to be connected on the road or at home. Um, and this with a uh, user experience that is similar as um, the experience they are experiencing in the, in the company premises. So let's first look at some evolutions of one technology today. And the first thing that we see is that companies more and more start to use internet as an alternative mm -hmm. to private MPLS. 
And this, for example, has to do with um, the migration to the cloud. Um, because Im imagine the traditional path um, traffic needs to take to uh, cloud services eh, with the internet breakout in the data center. Then the traffic needs to go through the private MPLS to the data center, go through a security stack to reach the internet and then the public cloud. In a way, centralizing um, this infrastructure in a data center makes sense because it's less investments, because you don't need to invest on local internet on all your sites, but it can also penalize the user experience. For example, the fact that, it's need, that the traffic needs to travel a longer path can add an extra bit of latency. Of course, in a Belgian context, this is really minimal. And also, um, if the one design isn't well dimensioned, it could be that it results in um, congestion in the data center because all traffic of all the different sites needs to pass through um, this data center. If we have a look at the second evolution that I want to discuss today, is that we see that there is a switch of classical quality of service to application mm -hmm. quality of service. And this has again to do with um, the migration to the cloud because as stated um, in the previous slides, the cloud typically it's reached by the internet, which is best effort, meaning that classical quality of service mechanisms doesn't work anymore. And then we see that networks become more and more application aware. They are able to detect the applications that are used in the network, give the, those applications the needed priority, and also select the best path to travel. As a third point, we see that customers or businesses require more and more flexibility. They want to have the ability to choose their own one technology, being, for example, internet or private MPLS. On top of that, they want to have a mix of different kind of access types, like, for example, mobile connectivity, VDSL, coax, or fiber to the home. And in some cases, they want to even um, mix um, different operators. And this all to optimize their total cost of ownership, but also to optimize their one design. And as the last evolution that I want to discuss with you today, um, we see that um, businesses more and more integrate mobile connectivity in their one design. 4G is becoming a valid alternative on um, accesses like VDSL or fiber to the home. It's easy and fast to deploy, and even with 5G, that will soon be coming. This will become even more important. So, but what is this software defined one? Let's have a look at a definition, a definition from whatis.com, a famous encyclopedia for um, information and technology. And they, they say that um, software defined one, in short, SD1, is a technology that distributes network traffic across wide area networks, that uses software defined networking cost concepts. So, those software defined networking concepts, it's an emerging technology in which we intelligently and centrally want to control um, the network via software applications. And in the case of software defined one, this is typically done by a controller, but more info on that later on. But let's continue with the description. Um, this to automatically determine the most effective way to route application traffic between branch offices and data center sites. And how is this done? This is typically done by um, two um, famous concepts of SD1. The first concept is application-based routing. So imagine on the right, you want to reach uh, the public cloud. In a traditional way, the traffic would go through the MPLS, to the data center, to the internet, and to the public cloud. And as said before, this can result in extra latency and maybe content, uh, congestion in the private data center. But imagine you're able to put an SD1 layer on top of it. And this as the one layer will identify the type of application used. And imagine that you want to re re reach the public cloud, then you can put a policy that directs this traffic to the internet, to the public cloud. Or imagine that you want to reach the private data center, then you can put a policy that uh, directs this traffic through the MPLS towards the private data center. 
Let's have a look at dynamic routing. And in dynamic routing, the network becomes aware thanks to the SD1 layer of the performance of your one connections. And imagine that the normal path to go to the public cloud is via one connectivity one. And that at a certain point, there is a performance issue measured, for example, uh, packet loss or an increase in heater or latency. Then the SD1 layer can decide to route traffic to 1.2 to the public cloud. So now let's have a look, quick look at how an SD1 design looks like. And in the middle, so you see this, um, this scheme is a bit abstract, but don't worry, I will uh, walk you through it. So in the middle, you see uh, the different one connectivities the sites can be connected to. So in the blue, you have the private MPLS. In the red, you have the internet, and green, you have mobile. And what will SD1 do? It will create a virtual transport layer over those um, one technologies, and that are a, a transport layer that is independent of the underlying transport layers. And then, typically, uh, SD1 solution consists out of, let's say, four components. You have the SD1, oh, sorry. You have the SD1 Edge, and this is a box that is placed on site and connected to the different um, to the different one connections. And this box will be in charge of initiating and terminating encrypted tunnels, but it will also be in charge of the application-based routing and the dynamic routing. Then a second component is the SD1 controller, the one that you see um, in blue there. Um, and this SD1 controller is in charge of the management of those SD1 edges. So it will assure that the devices are configured, that they are activated, that they have the correct IP addresses assigned, and that all the security policies and application-based routing policies and so on are um, configured on um, the devices. Then, as a third component, you have the self-service portal. And this self-service portal is an application or a web-based GUI that can be used by the end user, the administrator, or an operator. And this will give you a view on what is happening in your network. So you will see the performance of the different one connectivities. And you will see how decisions are made, and so on. But it will also allow the end user to push policies towards the com controller. And then as a last um, uh, component, we have the service orchestrator. And the service orchestrator is responsible, responsible for the complete service management of the SD1 service lifecycle. Let me just explain this with uh, a use case. Imagine that you want to um, have a bigger bandwidth on a certain side. Let's say you want to go from one gigabit to two gigabit. In this case, you need to have a request that needs to be sent to the controller to activate this new um, bandwidth on the devices. But this can also have an impact on other elements, like, for example, operating supporting, operator supporting systems a database that needs to be updated, or business supporting systems, like, for example, the invoicing that needs to go up because two gigs can be potentially um, um, ex more expensive than the one gig. So you need to have something that orchestrates all those requests. And this is um, the service orchestrator. So um, this is what concerns my part, in which I explained a bit the technicity of um, SD1. Oat. Thank you. Thank you, Dries, for uh, fixing the basics. Uh, that was a technical point. Uh, but Stefano, as a pre-sales manager, can you explain how you do translate this uh, technology into yeah. <coughs> uh, customer benefits? Yeah. Thank you, Oat. So let's have a zoom back and let's have a look at the, the business trends and the current market environment that uh, we are currently in. So for the last, the last uh, few years, we've seen an exponential data uh, explosion where we see more or less the data capacity, the data bandwidth mm -hmm. being doubled every year. And in the last uh, recent uh, COVID-19 uh, situation, we've seen even that that uh, doubling of data capacity um, even happened in a, in a period less than six months. So I can imagine that uh, this type of uh, data explosion would put your network at stress. Um, there is already mentioned the uh, cloud, uh, the 
uh, the trend towards more cloud uh, applications and cloud migrations. So that's also something that you need to plug in into your existing network and IT infrastructure. And um, for the other challenges, I can easily um, uh, revert them to the current uh, COVID-19 situation where I can imagine that your IT organization was put uh, really at stress to basically overnight, uh, you remember that on uh, third day there was the announcement of the government of going into confinement and basically overnight, over the weekend, you had to reorganize all of your IT and application infrastructure to host everything from remote. Uh, all your people were uh, obliged to work from a remote office, from the home office. So I can imagine that uh, that type of uh, uh, decision put a lot of stress on your IT uh, organization. Um, it meant that you had to react in a very flexible way, that you had to be very creative, that you had to <coughs> get everything uh, out of your uh, uh, competence, out of your people to get this, uh, get this done. Uh, so you had to be very lean, very flexible to cope with these uh, new challenges. We have more and more people. Uh, it was already a trend that was, uh, uh, that was starting. We see more and more business that allow their people to work from remote, from home. Uh, so. We also have the expectations of the employees that um, they um, have a type of internet at home type of uh, uh, experience of connecting to the corporate network, connecting to the corporate applications. Um, not only the employees, but I can imagine that also your customers, for example, that you have customers that you have um, a retail shop, a retail chain, where your um, um, uh, customers would like to have an um, digital experience like they have at home, where you can attract more people into the shops and where you can um, uh, have them buy more of your products. How would these business trends, this market environment, translate in challenges for your network? Right. So let's uh, discuss here a few points that might be uh, on your table and that you need to think about how to react on that. So first of all, there's the performance and availability of your network and your applications. Uh, most, uh, most of you recognize the challenge that uh, your system had to have to be up and running 24-7. Uh, every minute that an application or the network is not available, it will cost you money. Uh, it will have an impact on the user experience. So it becomes a very important KPI for the uh, IT organization where the management will uh, take a, um, a measuring point. In terms of security, I think that is one of the most <coughs> excuse me, uh, challenging uh, domains where your IT organization might be faced with. And we all remember the recent security breaches as, uh, in companies such as uh, ASCO or Picanol, where it has a major impact uh, on their business. They had to close down the production for days, for weeks. It had a huge impact on the production chain and on the reputation of these companies. In terms of the increased complexity, where Driss also was referring to, we see that there are a lot of IT interactions for keeping the network up to date in terms of maintenance and configuration. And you might uh, experience or uh, be in a situation where you have a lot of turnaround of your employees, people coming into the company, people leaving the company. So every time this is a whole new IT package that you have to uh, that you have to stage or that, that you have to break down. So all of this asks a lot of uh, effort and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, resources to your, uh, to your company. With these challenges, you will always be faced by a limited budget that has been put forward by your uh, direction that you, have to, that you have to cope with. And so uh, this increased complexity might demand more, uh, more resources in terms of um, uh, IT equipment and IT resources, uh, but on the other hand, you will have to work in a limited, uh, limited budget and you will always be asked to uh, prove the total cost of ownership of your whole infrastructure. So how could an SD1 solution possibly help you in this? So as Drizzle already mentioned, uh, if you have to plug in uh, the uh, uh, cloud environment in your uh, network architecture, I think SD1 might be a very good path, a very good road that you can take 
to uh, make that migration a lot more smoother and a lot more easier to manage. There's the one optimization. Eh? For example, um, currently that um, you are uh, working and, and uh, the, the, the limitation of the bandwidth is basically provided by the, the connectivity provider. So that's the limitation that you have to work with. But it's possible that your applications demand a higher bandwidth in, in certain uh, in certain circumstances, on a certain time of day. So you have to scale that very, and you need to have the ability to scale that in a very dynamic way. And as they want, eh, with application-based routing and dynamic routing can be a very good help uh, in this, uh, uh, for this demand. It's transport agnostic. So what do I mean by that? Basically, the SD1 layer does not care about who is the connectivity provider. So it allows you to make the the, the best choice of connect, connecting your HQ, your branch, independent from who is the operator. And nowadays, you're most of the time, you're limited to the connectivity uh, offer of your current operator. But in that case, you can really mix and match the type of connectivity with different operators according to the needs of that uh, typic, uh, typic branch. Security, uh, which I mentioned, that was one of the major challenges that you will face uh, in the coming years. Um, security is, in fact, provided by design in the SD1 layer. And we see that um, a, lot of, uh, uh, a lot of providers of SD1 solutions are basically coming from the security field, right? So they made a move of uh, building on top of their existing security stack and adding the SD1 layer on top. In terms of uh, uh, management, operational efficiency, uh, as the one offers you the, uh, the the benefit that it offers you a uh, single pane of glass across your whole network, right? Independent from the different connectivity providers, the different type of applications that you run, you will have uh, one single view and one sim uh, single control mechanism that you can use to uh, uh, manage this uh, complex environment. In terms of scalability, yeah, let's let's uh, see the the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the very uh, uh, famous concept of pop-up stores, for example. It's a typical uh, um, something typical that we see, for example, in the in the retail shop or the the interim sector, where they, uh, depending on the the time of year, they require a certain pop-up sto store at an at a certain uh, location. There, as the one offers the possibility to connect this pop-up store immediately into the whole management of the, uh, of the network. And in terms of user experience, I think the application-based routing uh, is a good, uh, a good way, let's say, of uh, uh, optimizing and monitoring also the user experience of working with uh, specific applications. Now, if, if we talk to our customers, we see that there's an, a big difference in type of maturity, the, the way that they are already uh, familiar with SD1, right? So what we see is that there's still customers who are not yet uh, um, fully busy with, with SD1. Uh, they, they know about it, they heard about it, maybe they're looking here at the, the, the webinar to know more about it. But basically, they do not see yet the added value or the, the business value that, could, could, uh, that it could bring to them. Uh, so typically, they're, let's say, a more, in a more conservative uh, environment where they stick to the legacy MPLS type of uh, environment and they um, don't see a reasoning for this additional cost that they had to put in the network. Second step, we see customers that are already uh, familiar with the, with the technology, but uh, they're not yet ready of adopting this uh, technology into their uh, uh, IT or network strategy. Then we have the customers who are uh, 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 adopting as they want more in their long-term approach and their long-term strategy, where they typically eh, have uh, cloud programs or a high demanding application uh, environment. So they're really thinking about how to integrate this in, this, uh, in their uh, whole network infrastructure. And then we have kind of the early adopters, those who were already busy with this for a couple of years. They did some proof of concepts, they did some lab, lab deployments, and they're already able to integrate as they want 
uh, in their overall strategy and their overall uh, cloud adoption program. So you might ask yourself, where in this maturity curve am I for the moment and how do I want to have SD1 integrated in my network strategy? So let's maybe uh, take a, a typical example. A typical example of, uh, let's say we take here an, uh, a template from an RFP, a request for proposal, a requirement that is set has been put forward by a, by a customer into the market to select the best vendor to help them with their network strategy, right? So we have, for example, uh, um, a customer who is uh, going from an on-prem type of uh, voice PBX to Microsoft Teams, who is uh, promoting heavily people working from home or remote, who is going for the full Microsoft Cloud uh, um, services stack. They already seen the importance of security, so they put security um, as a basic in their whole network strategy. They want to have an increased visibility on the application and the network. How is the network performing? How are the applications performing? What do I do if I see um, um, a red dot on my, on, my, on, on my monitoring tools when an application has increased latency, high packet drop, etc.? And the higher flexibility to really react fast to business changes, being scaling up or scaling down. Um, so in this typical uh, example, uh, the customer really asked for advice to the bidders, to the respondents of what would be the best solution in this case? Do I have to stick with my legacy MPLS network, which can cope for a lot of these requirements? Or do I have to move to an SD1 type of solution where it's going to be new for me, but possibly it might be a good, uh, I, a perfect fit for my, for my future needs, right? So here we typically see a customer who is being well informed about the possibilities, asks advice to the uh, competence in the market, and um, let's, let's say that this type of customer would be somewhere in the middle of that maturity curve. So you can ask yourself, what type of requirements do I have that might fit into the uh, SD1 topology? Now, in the end, uh, we believe that uh, um, uh, all customers and all networks, in the end, uh, will come to a certain, what we call an, the SD1 end state. Uh, for some customers, will take it a little bit longer to arrive there. Other ones are really have the road really paved out in that direction. So what we think as uh, network experts, let's say, is that there will be a, a hybrid type of uh, uh, setup where there will still be place for the traditional private IPVPN slash MPLS type of uh, networks for applications and use cases that really demand uh, a deterministic uh, network reactivity in terms of latency, bandwidth uh, guarantee, etc. And on the other hand, there might be a lot of use cases where a good quality internet connection is fine enough for small offices, for middle type uh, offices, and all the applications that are running on it. SD1 offers the, uh, the, the advantage that all of this network can be monitored and managed from a single pane of glass eh, via the SD1 orchestrator, and also allows you to integrate um, your uh, uh, cloud applications, being a private cloud, hybrid cloud, or public cloud. So uh, I would like to uh, hand over back to all because uh, I hear uh, a lot of questions from our customers and from the from the market out yeah. and. I think no, not all questions and answers are uh, um, uh, are not yet right. So maybe you can shine a light on that. Of course, uh, we already receive a um, lot of questions uh, amongst you. So of course we will uh, answer this after the session. But uh, let's begin with this first question. We often uh, we often uh, hear from the market. So this question is: uh, Will SD1 uh, decrease my costs? And uh, I want to say that, well, uh, it depends. And the first point to make is that there is a difference um, between a multinational context and a domestic market. So indeed, in a multinational context, it's quite obvious that connectivity costs will be much higher if you use an MPLS connectivity 
than if you use an internet, local internet, cheaper uh, connectivity. But in a domestic market, it's different because if we look uh, at the price of uh, an MPLS, we see that we are around the same price for an MPLS connectivity than for uh, a dual uh, local internet connectivity. On top of that, if you want to rely on uh, critical business applications, you can't say that you will only use uh, internet access and you will have to add this SD1 appliance uh, over it, which is a incremental cost. So it's not less expensive in Belgium. On top of this, you can look at the features that are linked to MPLS, who are the security, the classical quality of services, and the uh, uh, guaranteed bandwidth. And uh, one more time, in this case, it's the MPLS who will win the game. So the question may be, in which case do I have to uh, use an SD1? So those features will be right for multinational companies, but also in Belgium. So those cases will be the first. If you need extra bandwidth, so typically if you are making your digital transformation and using more and more applications, connecting more and more users and devices, maybe you will be in this case. And maybe your MPLS won't be able anymore to support all these bandwidths. So in this case, you will have to multiply your uh, one, maybe have two, and in this case, an easy one uh, can be interesting. The second case is uh, if you want application-aware networks. So as we said, uh, the SD1 is application-aware, and it's will be, it will be typically the case of uh, a company moving to the cloud, so meaning um, passing critical data and applications uh, through the internet. And so it means that uh, you will need uh, some monitoring and uh, some information at uh, applicative uh, level. That's the second case. And the third case, uh, so uh, it's uh, the network expander case, let's say. Uh, it's uh, uh, if you want uh, some more agility and speed. So uh, if you want to add more sites, if you want to add uh, more users, and you want to uh, push your policies in bulk to be, uh, to be faster. So in those cases, as the one uh, can be interesting, uh, as both of you guys uh, explained uh, just before. What we see at the moment um, is that most of companies moving to SD1 rely on uh, hybrid networks. So they continue to use the MPLS and they add uh, internet connectivity uh, and they use MPLS uh, at least for uh, critical sites uh, such as uh, headquarters or data centers for the mentioned uh, reasons that are security, quality of service and guaranteed bandwidth. But now let's see concrete, uh, concretely uh, what it gives uh, in terms of uh, numbers. So those numbers are uh, estimations uh, or calculations done by uh, one of our, of, uh, our partners, uh, which is Cisco. And it's a case um, where the clients use a Mara uh, Meraki device. So they use it for the SD1, but they also use it uh, for the managed land part, because this uh, partner does both. Uh, and what we see is that you can save up, up to 20% in terms of CAPEX, so that's mainly linked to the cost of the connectivity uh, and the price of the vendor, but that it's not this part uh, which is the most interesting. The other part is the above uh, numbers uh, that are the OPEX, and you can see that you can save up to 90% uh, in OPEX. And how do you do that? Um, it's mainly because the solutions, um, so SD1 solutions, uh, are, uh, have this uh, zero-touch provisioning feature. Uh, so this zero-touch provisioning feature will really help your teams uh, in gaining times um, in the, um, uh, yeah, in, can be in deployment, uh, so you can in deployment pass from uh, several days uh, or weeks to a couple of days or one day. Troubleshooting uh, can, be done, uh, can be done in a few hours. 
and uh, also um, the, the deployment that you can make in a bulk in a few clicks. So that's the reason why this solution really can reduce your OPEX when you need uh, the previous uh, configurations I explained. But know that I hope that uh, you well understood the advantages uh, of the SD1 when you face some complicated networks, then it could be interesting to have a view on the different ways to get ready with it. So, Stefan? Okay, thank you, Aud. So, uh, yeah, that iceberg looks pretty interesting, right? So, um, how, you, how should you see it, right? So, what we typically see in the market, and this is uh, one of the recent studies um, 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 showing the deployment models that are being used in the market, so we have about uh, one-fifth, 80% um, of the, the enterprises that go for a, a fully outsourced managed type of solution, yeah, where the, the integrator or the provider or the operator takes care of the, the whole management of the SD1 layer. There's about one-third or 33% who think, okay, maybe it's more interesting that I do the management myself. And uh, there's about 50%, let's say that's the undetermined uh, population, uh, that go for a co-managed model. How do you need to see that? It's like um, they are uh, still relying on the uh, operator management for the connectivity layer and then where the uh, SD1 orchestra orchestration layer on top, they're handling it themselves. In reality, what we see is that this 50% in the end will split up, of, split up in one of the above two cases being fully management or self-management. So it's kind of a learning curve. It's kind of an uh, uh, evolution, evolutionary model where in the end people go to a fully managed type of solution or a fully DIY solution. So where do we typically see this uh, do-it-yourself type of approach versus the managed service provider? So we see this type of approach with customers that uh, uh, can be considered as early adopters. Yeah? These people often have uh, people in the uh, in-house who are already quite familiar uh, being part of the strategy or being part of personal interest that can that understand this technology that played with it and that over time gained a certain knowledge and competence in this matter uh, so they're feeling quite confident of uh, uh, using this uh, uh, sd1 technology in their network there's also the zero touch provisioning promise of sd1 uh, where um, compared to the legacy MPLS where you have to, uh, still a lot of CLI type of command uh, interfacing to do, where this type of cloud managed and uh, uh, web based managed uh, type of solution is uh, very tempting to do it uh, to do it yourself. It's very uh, intuitive, it's very uh, easy to follow, and uh, uh, it might have people decide to uh, try it themselves. So what are the elements that you need to take into account when uh, you would uh, consider a DIY, a do-it-yourself approach? So uh, first of all, if you already have the system knowledge in-house, it might make sense that uh, you're doing it yourself. Eh? What you do yourself, you'd often do better, right? Uh, you can uh, probably have more faster responding times to changes, to new deployments, to uh, provisioning, because you have the people in-house. It's just an internal question that you have to set out, and the changes are done right on the, on the spot, where in the operator model or the managed model, you need to create a ticket at the, uh, uh, the operator si uh, side. You have to rely on the uh, uh, agreed SLAs to execute your changes, etc. On the other hand, right, you know that your uh, network is business critical, so you need to assure that your internal team can cope with a 24-7 type of support. So this requires quite some investment in your IT and your technical staff. They have to be available, let's say, 24-7. Eh? Building a 24-7 uh, resource team might take quite some uh, 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 resources. You have to make sure that uh, their, uh, their knowledge uh, remains up to date, so you have to train them. Uh, uh, they have to uh, be um, up to date on the, uh, the latest uh, 
developments, etc. So these are all things that you need to take into account, making the business case of doing it yourself or leaving it to an operator. So what could a managed service provider bring on the table, right? So first of all, you need to ask yourself, is this really a core business that I want to have my people taking care of, right? So every minute that they spend in management of the, the network or the SD1 layer, they cannot spend on something else that might be considered more important in your company as a core activity, right? Uh, so uh, that is an, uh, kind of a pain that we can, the managed service provider can take away from you. Uh, the managed service provider will all, always make sure that they have the specialized skills in-house, they will do the training, they will do the, the updating of the, uh, of the people on a regular basis because typically they serve a lot of customers so they really need to have the specialized team in-house. In terms of scalability, you need to make sure that uh, you can follow the, 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 the growth or the changes in, in your network and typically a managed service provider is well equipped to, uh, uh, to manage a, a large domain of, uh, of networks. And in terms of availability, a uh, managed service provider will always take care of, of respecting the SLA, often a 24-7 type of support in operations and troubleshooting, uh, etc. So uh, we've touched here on a, a couple of points that uh, uh, a couple of crossroads, let me let me say, that you can un encounter on the, the road that you're uh, heading on for SD1. So by this, we're coming to an end of this uh, webinar, right? So uh, uh, passing the clicker back to Odd, I would say, what could we conclude of this, uh, this story, Odd? Yeah. So... What we can conclude is that uh, the advantages uh, of the SD1 when you face some uh, network challenges, uh, business challenges, uh, and complexity, sorry, and complexity, uh, the advantages are, are quite obvious, or so I hope after <laughs> this webinar, but the road too is not that simple and you really have to uh, focus on the following questions uh, that are why would I have to move, so the reasons why, when, and what will be the phasing, because you don't have to do uh, the move in one time, and the how to, so manage services or do it yourself. Um, of course, we uh, as a range uh, are here to guide you uh, and help you to answer th those questions, so feel free to contact us. Uh, but uh, first, let's have a look on the questions you already have. So, guys, the questions I have. Uh, the first one is about the security. So, how secure is an SD1 network? Is it uh, as secured as MPLS? Who wants to answer this? I, uh, I can answer this. If, uh... So, let's first take a step back, eh? if we compare internet with private MPLS, um, private MPLS, normally if you have a trusted operator like us, Orange, you can be sure that um, the data of your company is, stays private and segregated from all other networks. But as the one gives an extra security level on top of it, because it will create encrypted tunnels between different sites, assuring that the information that you sent from one site to, the, to another site is always encrypted. And on top of that, a lot of SD1 solutions also have other built-in security features like firewalls, um, intrusion detection, malware, malware detection, and so on. So SD1 really brings an extra security level on um, the private MPLS that we have today. So I hope this answers the question. Maybe another? I hope so as well. Uh, another question. Uh, is it possible to replace an MPLS line with, for example, two cheap internet lines? Yeah, OK. Maybe uh, I'll take that one. Yeah? Thank you. Yeah, it might be very tempting, of course, of uh, going uh, into that direction of do doing an, uh, a full-blown replacement of uh, classical MPLS by uh, internet connectivity, right? I think in terms of uh, bandwidth and the quality that we have of internet here in Belgium, 
it might make sense, but uh, let me refer back uh, to uh, uh, the slides that I have presented, that there's um, always some use cases that, uh, uh, that would still require an, um, uh, an MPLS type of solution eh, where uh, you uh, need to rely on uh, fixed latency, really guaranteed bandwidth, uh, and in the end, that's, uh, um, you need to list, in fact, the use cases that you have within your company, and it might be very good that a dual internet connection uh, with an SD-1 orchestration layer on top of it might be uh, the perfect fit for your enterprise, right? But then um, I would suggest that uh, you, you really document that and uh, do very good testing on the, the, the impact on your uh, uh, applica application performance. And it might be that, uh, and, and still our strong belief that uh, the, the end state of such, uh, of modern net network architecture will always be a type of a hybrid, uh, yeah. hybrid setup. We say then. Um, next question. Will the network tend to become fully internet-based or 4G, 5G-based? Yeah, that's a question that I maybe can uh, respond to. So, um, as already said, uh, we think that um, we will more evolve to, let's say, the hybrid um, situation where customers will take a mix of um, internet and private MPLS because uh, both um, networks have their advantages. Eh? As indicated, private MPLS, it's more secure and you have dedicated bandwidth, you can do quality of service and so on. So it will be a, a hybrid mix. Um, what, what concerns the question about uh, will mobile connectivity replace um, fixed connectivity? Here as well, I think um, we will have a, a hybrid situation because um, specific locations will not always have um, the fixed connectivity or um, the mobile um, connectivity. So depending on where you, where you are, one um, type of um, access can be more suitable. And I think um, it even becomes better when you um, come, let's say, to a combination of both types of um, connection where you have a mobile connection and a fixed connection that are redundant, that gives you uh, a more reliable um, network. Okay, thank you. Uh, next one. How does SD1 support cloud connectivity? Okay, maybe uh, I can uh, take that one out. So basically, SD1 is really tailored to um, um, to cope with uh, uh, cloud adoption programs and cloud connectivity. Specifically, because uh, at the beginning, the Dries explained uh, the technical part of the, uh, of the presentation, uh, where the, um, the features of dynamic routing and application-based routing will um, make it possible that uh, the applications always takes the, the best path towards the cloud, right? B basically, independent of the underlying connectivity layer. So where uh, in a today legacy environment, you need to work with fixed routes with an, a very deter deterministic path towards your cloud, um, the SD1 layer on top will, will make this model more flexible and can react more quickly on changes in the network, on the network behavior, right? So um, also the fact that uh, the quality of the applications are being monitored on a, on a constant basis, will uh, uh, um, make this type of technology very fitting for an uh, uh, of plugging cloud strategy into your legacy network. Okay. okay. Right. And uh, maybe I'm looking at the timing, so it will be the next one. But of course, uh, we will be happy to recontact you to answer the other ones uh, and speak about your specific uh, situation, of course. But so the last one for today, does SD1 support, uh, yeah, that's competition, does SD1 support several access providers and how? Okay. Shall I, I take, take it, Riz, or? You can take the honors. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, uh, 
Uh, good question, and I think that is uh, one of the major benefits of uh, of SD1 today. Uh, in fact, uh, the possibility already exists today, right? So we see that uh, some uh, some customers choose the best type of connectivity which is available on a certain location, and sometimes it's uh, with operator A and others connectivity is with operator, operator B, B. But in, in terms of management and control of your routing, it becomes quite complex, right? And it's always remain kind of a static type of uh, uh, environment. Uh, so I think this is one of the use cases where, uh, that is really used where SD1 is built up. Um, so it uh, leaves the freedom to the, the, uh, the customer to choose the best type of uh, uh, connectivity on that typical location for that typical need, right? So you could uh, imagine that uh, a certain location might have an, uh, um, the best fiber connectivity with operator A, right? You want to have, you want to add uh, mobile connectivity 4G plus 5G in the near future for operator B, and the SD1 layer on top will make it possible that the um, the applications are basically um, uh, unaware of the under underlying technology. So I believe that will be one of the uh, like the most successful use cases where SD1 can prove its uh, uh, its purpose. Okay, right. So this question will close uh, the session of today. Uh, as mentioned, uh, we will we would be happy to answer the other questions that are still remaining in the flow. Uh, if you didn't have the time to ask your question, feel free to uh, fill the contact uh, formulaire. Um, and you also can uh, review this webinar uh, on the page that you see on your screen. Thank you guys uh, for those explanations. Welcome. I hope it's clear for uh, everyone. Uh, and thank you all for uh, being with us today. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.